this show's a treat for me. Today we're going to visit the very first restaurant I worked at when I arrived in Manhattan as a graduate of the CIA. The Four Seasons. Stay tuned. It's hard to overstate the importance of the Four Seasons in the history of American restaurants. Let's just say that it is and continues to be one of the best restaurants in America and has been since it opened in 1959. The pool room might be one of the most civilized dining rooms on the planet. Shimmering beaded curtains cover the floor-to-ceiling windows to the south and west. At the center of the room, a 20-foot square Carrera marble pool gurgles. Enter the grill room and you'll be stunned by the sheer scale of it all. Soaring 22-foot ceilings, walls covered with three-inch thick panels of center-cut, old-growth French walnut, a million dollars worth in 1959 money, and Richard Lippold's sculpture consisting of thousands of varying length bronze tubes hangs over the rectangular bar. The lunch crowd in the grill room is the quintessential New York power lunch. Every day, a who's who from the worlds of publishing, finance, advertising, entertainment, and politics gather to see and be seen. And of course, they eat very, very well. I'd like you to meet the two owners, Julian Nicolini and Alex Von Bitter. In 1959, you look at the architecture today, and it looks like it was built yesterday. yesterday. Yeah. Well, in, in all honesty, I mean, everybody needs to understand that this restaurant is, is probably the only restaurant in America that, that in 1959, between 1959 and the time of Windows on the World, that there were no other restaurant built to be a restaurant in between at all. I mean, this was the only restaurant in America that was designed to be a restaurant. Straight up. Straight right. up. It wasn't in a brownstone. It wasn't I mean, all a brownstone. All the French restaurants were downstairs, low ceilings. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It wasn't a hole in the wall, let's put it this way. Like, yeah. even today, a lot of people, you know, they call you up and said, you know, we have space, we have retail right, space, would right. you like to put a restaurant Build in? it out. It's a big, big difference, yeah. If, if you have an enormously uh, uh, great design, it goes through phases. So right, so first it's, it's shocking and avant-garde, then at some point it becomes dated, and then if it's really great, it becomes a classic. Yeah. But you have to have the willpower and, and the tenacity to stay through that time when they say it's dated. It was a dream team to begin with, combining the considerable architectural talents of Philip Johnson with the restaurant impresarios Joe Baum and Jerry Brody, the Swiss chef Albert Stokely and Albert Kuhlman as the pastry chef. That's quite a bit of talent under one roof, and that's just for starters. So we have this nexus of the original restaurant yeah. associates, people who were aware. Oh, James Beard, right. for sure. There's yes. no question about that, because I think it was basically the greatest you know, cook in, in America, let's put it this way. And then you had this incredible impresario by the name of Joe, Joe Baum, Baum, which basically invented this, uh, this kind of restaurant. I think that was really the beginning of, you know, the new revolution about enjoying food in great restaurants, going to a restaurant where you can really enjoy yourself, and also going to a restaurant where it's like going to mu the Museum of Modern Art and, you know, feeling very comfortable about yourself. A lot of this, for me, is, is through reading, but I mean, the, that early influence, the wonderful, you, I mean, the idea, the Four Seasons, which we haven't even talked about, the concept at that time, in 1959, 1960, of changing a menu, literally changing a menu seasonally was unheard of. And to serve seasonal foods. This was the 50s. If you look at the magazines, Life Magazine, Time Magazine, they were full of, of advertisements for frozen foods. And restaurants use them. Of course. Canned and frozen. Because it was great. You yeah. could have strawberries whenever you wanted to. Well, here was a restaurant that said, hey, this is no good. It doesn't taste as good. Why, why, should, we, why should we serve a peach that's canned yeah. or lychee or anything. peas, right. anything? Right. In the uh, early 1970, with the new American Revolution, mm -hmm. Seppi Rengli, was, which was then the chef, started to really think about the American product more than ever before. I mean, I would like to give the most credit to Alice Water as far as the West Coast is concerned, but as far as the East Coast is concerned, I know that a lot of people like to take credit, but I don't believe that there's another restaurant in the East Coast, and the Eastern part of you know, mm -hmm. the United States of America who has much more influence to American people about 
American food and American cuisine. First and foremost, I cook, okay? For me, a restaurant, if the food's not good, forget it. I don't know how nice the dining room is, the service staff is wonderful, but if the food's not good, I'm not coming back. One of the things that makes the Four Seasons, one of the main things, so exceptional, is over the years, the food has always been great. You know, never does backflips, never stuff you've never seen before, well, maybe a little bit in the 80s, but consistently excellent, every meal, every service, every plate, 24-7. They've been doing this now for, what, 45 years? And that opens is 59. Let me introduce this guy, because you're wondering who the hell I'm talking about. Christian Alden, otherwise known as Hitch. Years ago, when I was much thinner, I worked here. I was a little apprentice. Me too. <laughs> he still works here, but and he's not there. <laughs> Chef was Seppi Rankley, who didn't like me. He called me Hans and Gluck. You'll have to tell me what that means someday. Yeah. Happy Hans. It wasn't a compliment. Happy Hans. Yeah. It wasn't a compliment. But I remember Hitch from back then. He's been here for what? How many years? I'm here now, 30 years. Tell me about your philosophy. You, you, you do the menus here. The menus change with the seasons. The, uh, the, uh, the way we have to do it these days is just stay with uh, ingredients, mostly that are grown around New York, around here, our farmers, our, the freshest thing that you can get. Try to get the best tomatoes you can get. Try to only sell tomatoes when they're in season. When they're season. The fish, the same thing. Stay away from Chilean sea bass and all these kind of uh, endangered species. Try to get fresh line cut fish uh, and do something with that and, 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 and stay away from, uh, I don't know, I, I, I just don't like uh, farm raised salmon. Maybe one day some, we have to eat it because like nothing. there is no more. Yeah. But I hate it. And uh, just stay with the freshest ingredients you can get. You go by the season, and these days everything has changed. We have we have farmers around here that do everything. Yeah, the ingredients are unbelievable. You remember about what, what, what was it? 20 years ago? Forget it. There was nothing, nothing around. And the planes came in from JFK from the yeah, Rolls Market, and whatever it. the other cover looked like, you took them. Whatever the Dover Soul looked like, you took them. Yeah. Yeah. Now we get rams locally, we get fiddle ferns, we get strawberries locally, tomatoes locally, all the cabbages, all, all the, the mushrooms, beets, all, the, all the mushrooms. Incredible line cut fish you're saying. Yeah. Locally. And that's okay. what we have to support. I remember this guy's name because Seppi Rankley was one of the chefs, and I would always hear, Lanza! Lanza! Still here, still here. How many years you've been here? Uh, 27 years now. 27 years. Right, I started in 1977. One of the many ingredients to making this restaurant so successful is consistency. You guys have been at this high level since day one. And I mean, you're making these sauces every day. You have people that eat here five days a week. Right. So, and every day you're producing the same exact perfect flavor, same sauce without deviation. Yeah, well we use very good ingredients in this, in this restaurant. Uh, I've been doing it for quite a while, so. <laughs> You've got it down. <laughs> and there's a lot of teamwork in this kitchen. Yeah. I mean, there's yeah, a lot yeah. of guys that have been here a long, like It's, all, it's old here. school, though. You know, it's old school, the guys know what they have to do. And they come inside, they prep, they get the job done. You know, we work hard, but everybody knows each other, everybody gets along. When you say old school, give me, uh, flesh that out for me, because I know old I... Old school, you know, you know, you come in, you work hard, and you put it out every single day the same way. Yeah, consistent, you know, consistent, consistent, consistent. And the same person does the same yeah. thing all the time, so that never changes. No one's reinventing the potato here. No one's trying to come up with the newest garnish or sauce or some wacky ingredient. Consistent, consistent, all the time. Spot all the on. time. I mean, we have a lot of new items also, but I mean, but when you get them the done, the basics are always the basics. Yeah. yeah. Simplicity is the hardest, and but look at the art. We change art with every season, thanks to Arnie Glimsher at Pace Gallery. Uh, we're hoping to get a Rauschenberg for next season. Mm. Something that entices people to come and check it out and to try something new. And of course, the menus are still about that. Uh, we get brand new cherry blossom trees in next week. I saw the, I saw uh, the, yeah. It's gonna be cool. Pink, pink's yeah. gonna be the color. It keeps us interested. We're here with Lawrence Maitre d', who's a well-seasoned four seasons here, who's going to demo a few things for us. Lawrence, how are you? I'm excellent. Thank you. Tell me the first thing you're going to do here. Uh, we're going to do uh, steak tartare okay. and from scratch. From scratch. The way you would, customer comes in order steak tartare, this Absolutely. is what they get? Yes. Okay. So what I'll do is, um, you know, it comes out in a, this kind of a shape, but the egg yolk, and so it's just spread it a little bit. Onions, some of the uh, chives, and, uh, of course some papers. Finally, uh, made okay. into a paste. Okay. So it 
blends well with the meat. Absolutely, Worcestershire sauce. So it's done. a good Dijon mustard. Yes. And I'm not skimpy with that. Some salt. Some cracked black pepper. Yeah. Top of olive oil. Touch of balsamic. Pepper. Okay. And of course some uh, the pasta. Blend it all together. And then you just shape it into a something something attractive. Something resembling a lobster sirloin. Good on it. That's beautiful. This is classic. This is a the roast Long Island duck for two. For two? Yes, it is. Yeah. A signature dish of the Four Seasons. Before we start on the side that faces the customer by just making an incision around the leg. Separate the thigh from the drumstick. We uh, make an incision along the uh, breastbone and just slide the knife along the carcass, separate the skin from the breast itself, and bring away the last butt. Place it on top like that. This looks good. This is really, I call it a crackling, and uh, mm. people will tell you it's probably the best part of it. It is. People and me. We uh, serve it with wild rice. It has some pine nuts in it, mushrooms. Really traditional. Place the baked apple on there. That's what that is. That's in, in a little bit of puff pastry? Yes, it is. It has uh, some cinnamon, some spices, little cream crackers with a touch of crumb. And then, of course, there's the sauce. It's a, uh, a duck based uh, demi glace with, uh, in this case, apple extract. I think I can see why that's a big seller. No? Yeah, people like the presentation. People. You know, there's not that many restaurants that do this table side anymore. And, uh, um, Obviously, you start with a top quality product. The duck is beautiful. I mean, it was a huge breast, really big, healthy bird. It, it is quite a big portion, so you need a good appetite, but uh, uh, I think it's well worth it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. It was great. Fundamentally, it will always be the same. It's about breaking bread in a comfortable place. And a comfortable place in New York City is a place that allows you to breathe and to be yourself. The one thing that you can't fake is experience and loyalty yeah. and friendship. You can't fake that. Our mission is to be the best restaurant in the world. We're part of the past, we're part of the present, and we hope to be part of the future. And that takes a lot of effort to always put the customer first. This is a very so-called democratic restaurant for a very simple reason, that we're going to take care of, let's say, of Henry Kissinger because he comes here like once or three times a week, like somebody that comes back from Philadelphia, they want to enjoy themselves for only one time. Mm. We're going to respect exactly the same, the same, mm -hmm. in the same fashion. My personal favorite is the smallest party, a party of two, where a man proposes. And we do a lot of proposals. That's and great, of man. course, they are nerve wracking <laughs> for the for individual. <laughs> and for us, it's getting the timing right and, yeah. and keeping our fingers crossed that she says yes. And, and they become lifelong friends because usually they come back on anniversaries. One would think there'd be a lot of memory there, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the future, where do you see, what, what do you see going on here? Steady, just keeping the same service, keeping it fresh for you? Well, I think that the future has a lot to do with um, the economy in this country. Yeah. I think that the future is basically all, all nowadays, all, also basic on the economy, economic yeah. situation of the world. Um, I know that people have to definitely have to go out and enjoy themselves. People have, it's much better for them to, to break bread at a table in a restaurant and have um, a tele-conversation over the internet or a conversation yeah. somewhere else. I think it's much better to, to think about the fact that uh, it's really important to share a bottle of wine, share some great food with your um, counterpart instead of just uh, giving it all up. I remember for years, what was the table number? 30 something? 32. 32. The Philip Johnson had lunch here every day. This was, the, so talk to me. Philip Johnson. Well, Philip, was. unfortunately, he's, he's ailing and he's in his late 90s. And uh, I get updates from all the other uh, 
architects who go to see him. And Peter Eisenman went to see him a couple of weeks ago. And he said, Philip, you know, the Four Seasons is not the same without you. And he had a wonderful, witty moment. And he says, listen, Peter, the Four Seasons is nothing without me. <laughs> there you go. And I like that. Four Seasons, we do this crab cake thing, right? I saw the crab cakes there doing a little riff on crab cakes. I want to do it with some kind of vegetable with some acid and some crunch to it. So I'm thinking snap peas, tomatoes is a good textural component. I got these big boys, which are just baby Roman vine right? but they're a little big next to the snap peas. And I've got these guys that are teeny weeny little. These will be better, because I'm thinking these are gonna have to sit next to snap peas. Small's good. Doing a big tomato, small snap pea, not good. So in the bag. All right, sugar snap peas. You know, these are just gonna grab a handful. We don't need a ton. Next stop, coriander. This is nice stuff. Fresh, organic, I'm loving it. Garlic, I try and pick ones that have big cloves because I'm the one that peels them. These aren't too bad. We'll get some crab meat here and see how this works. We'll get a couple of these. Check out line and off to the kitchen. That first season shoot for me was so, you know, exciting to do. Not for nothing, it was my first restaurant job in Manhattan. I mean, actually, I had a job. I was waiting in the Vista Hotel. I came down out of the CIA. I had a little apartment at the Mitchell Lama buildings on Greenwich Street, 310 Greenwich. Uh, was on the waiting list. Got a job at the Vista Hotel, which was in the ground floor of the World Trade Center, which is, of course, no longer there. The hotel went after the first bombing. Um, Seppi had me on the waiting list, and when the phone rang and I got the job, I was thrilled. I mean, I would read about this place. I knew about Scott. Scott was a hero to me, and he was. You know. This was before chefs had agents, and it was such a big deal that Sepp Rankley was one of the best guys I've ever worked with to this day. Just a man at the top of his craft. Um, so going there to do the show was just a treat. It was like going home and seeing Hitch and Lonza and the guys that were still there, and Alex and Julian that were there when I was there. It was great. I, I had a meal there with my family that was, you know, just wonderful. If, if Restaurants had personalities. The Four Seasons would be Cary Grant, I think. You know, middle-aged, really handsome, aged extraordinarily well, impeccable manners, graceful. I mean, the, it just has it. You know, you go into that room and it's stunning. Um, the menu is just spot on. I mean, the food doesn't totally wow you. Yeah, there's places in town that maybe you're doing, you know, a higher tightrope act without a net, but the food's just solid. It's great. It just delivers on the promise, and the service is just to die for. So. It's one of those great old school restaurants. They're just still doing it right. I mean, you know, going on 45 years and they're packed. So you do the math. It, it's a class act. So what am I going to cook? You know, roast duck? I don't know. And except the, I mean, he was great, but he's not, he, he did all sorts of stuff. So I'm going to do something simple. We, the night we were there, we saw they have crab cakes on the menu. And, you know, crab cakes, there's a lot of different ways to play around with them. They had them as these sort of almost kind of, you know, egg-shaped, pan sauteed with a mustard sauce and a vegetable garnish, real simple. But at the end of the day, what's a crab cake? It's a sort of quintessential American cuisine, I think. I don't know if they had them in France before we made them. Um, you get jumbo lump crab meat. Now, at home, I would use backfin, but this is a Four Seasons show, and I know they're not buying backfin. So you get great jumbo lump crab meat. You, go th you pick through it without breaking it up too much. Make sure there's no shells. I use fresh breadcrumbs. And to do this, you get good fresh bread, you know, white bread, cut the crust off, put it in the cuisine art, and just brrr, pulse it until it's soft and fresh. All I want to do is use just the minimal amount of breadcrumb, minimal amount of mayonnaise to hold the crab meat into a cake, and then I'm going to flavor it with lemon juice, little mustard, little Worcestershire sauce, some chopped coriander. So it should be this light, flaky ball that when you put your fork into it, it almost falls apart. Screams of crab meat, um, not of fill. All right, we're just going to Invert this. I mean, this is nice stuff. And then usually jumbo lump doesn't have much shell in it. But, you know, I'm going to go through the formality. Occasionally, you find a piece of something in there. Into the mixing bowl it goes. Pass the inspection. Just got a little breadcrumb here. Not a whole lot. I don't want it to taste of bread. It's supposed to be crabby. This is just the binder. A little bit of mayonnaise. mustard. Not too much because this is a good Dijon mustard. It's pretty hot. I just want this for a little background flavor. Worcestershire sauce. Just a touch of sugar. 
I always put this in because you think crab meat's supposed to be sweet, so sometimes it's just nice to you know, push that sweetness. The Chinese use sugar unabashedly, and they sure know how to cook. Some lemon juice, which just helps, I think, polish flavors. You know, this it's a nice just acid counterpoint to the richness of the crab meat. This is going to be a few tablespoons of fresh coriander leaves, no stems, just the leaves. Mix this now. If I have to add a touch more mayonnaise, I can do that at any point. Let me just see where it is. Okay, done. This is going to be it. And we're just going to form these. Again, I don't want to overwork these. And I make them small because one of the things I like about crab cakes is the crispiness of the outside Chuck's disposed with the creaminess of the inside. And if you make them too big, it's too creamy, not enough crispy. So I make them little kind of mini, mini balls like that. And it's pretty rich food, too. A couple of these little salted water. I'd say we cooked them for a minute and a half to two minutes. Do a colander, olive oil here, touch of garlic. I want these tomatoes to break down. Watch this little water. Don't worry about that. And a little snow pea action. Turn that flame down. Some salt. And next act, crab cakes. Not too hot, but hot enough. That sounds good. That sounds good. And just real gently, we're going to cook these. Give the other two another minute. Then I just got this idea. Just a little bit of basil and fresh parsley. Now that the heat's off, just to coat these. Give it a little kind of herb background. going to be tasty. All right, these are just about done. You know, if you're cooking crab cakes, you're not cooking raw anything. The crab meat's been cooked already when it's been processed. You don't have to cook this through like it's a piece of raw uh, protein. So I just want to get them, get them to temperature and get them on the plate. Cut my little schmear here. All right, we've got our Little peas, the little crab cakes. I guess if you want, you could put a little sauce with this, but I don't think it needs it. Just real simple. Cut into one of those crab cakes and show you what we mean about just falling apart. Just, you know, real delicate. Big chunks of crab meat. Can't go wrong. What, what uh, Julian had said, and Alex said too, so too, you go to that restaurant. It's the only restaurant I can think of in America, except for Windows, which isn't here anymore, that was built from the ground up to be a restaurant. The space. It's astonishing. If you haven't been to the Four Seasons, give yourself a treat and go. You, you can't appreciate the room, the grandeur of the place. I mean, it's, it's a landmark building, so it's not going to change a bit. It's not allowed to. But you really can't appreciate the, the grandeur of the room, the drama of sitting in midtown Manhattan on Park Avenue with, you know, 22-foot ceilings, the gurgling pool, or the grill room by day. Um, and the service is extraordinary. I mean, the guys run such a tight team. Uh, that in New York, anywhere in America, is harder and harder to find anymore. You know, for me, this is just one of the great American restaurants of all time. Um, it's kind of like rediscovering it, going back to do this show, and I was bowled over. So anyway, enough with me throwing, heaping, whatever the word is, heaping praise on it. But it really is. It's worth the trip. It's a phenomenal place. Um, Seppi, thanks for all the stuff I learned from you. Alex and Julian and the team in the front of the house, thanks a lot. Hitch, you're the best, and the guys that work with you, thank you. So. Until next week, eat well often, eat regional ingredients, and cook at home and play around with it. See ya.